For measurements of annual ice layer thickness over the past 15,000 years, the authors find that Greenland's climate emerging from the last ice age twice shifted from glacial to interglacial conditions over an astonishingly quick three to five years. Now, can you imagine glacial to interglacial? Can you imagine that, that our world shifting from interglacial conditions now into full glacial mode within three to five years? What, what would that imply for the stability of our civilization? Well, it would imply, I think, that it, our, our entire civilization would collapse completely because there's so many ramifications to, to what that means. Um, and of course, you know, if we shifted into a full glacial mode now, um, yeah, I mean, we're going to experience the same kind of agricultural collapses that we saw on a lesser scale during the, the Little Ice Age and the, the Dark Ages, right? I mean, I think we would see a global collapse of agriculture. We would see extreme cold that people wouldn't have been able to adapt. I mean, it would spell clearly the end of our civilization. But this is what the scientific record is showing. Now, here's uh, a graph of sea level rise showing the two spikes. The, the one on the right is meltwater pulse 1A, which is now dated to about 14,600. The one on the left is uh, meltwater pulse 1B. And you see that there's, there's double graphs because when this was done, the dating hadn't been refined to the extent that it has now. So there was, this is actually showing the range. Uh, like if you look at meltwater pulse 1A, you'll see there's a range. It shows there uh, between the earliest estimated time that it occurred and the, the latest. And you'll see that dashed line, kind of that curved line going up, coming down. That would be sort of the previous model of a smooth melting, Re reaching a, a peak and then tapering off. And, but now, once we have much more accurate information to go on, we see that it wasn't a smooth curve, it was a spiked phenomenon. And interestingly, this is the late Pleistocene mortality graph. Um, for those of you that want to see this better, you know, I can provide these, the sources for this, but you can see that, interestingly, you'll see that that graph of, that's the late Pleistocene mega mammals that inhabited the Earth that are now gone. And I'll mention something briefly about them. Um, we've lost roughly half of the species of animals over 100 pounds in body weight. Uh, anything over 100 pounds in body weight or about 44 kilos is a, um, considered a mega mammal. So we're in a room here full of mega mammals. Um, so if, it's a new way for you to think about yourself. Unless, you're, unless you weigh less than 100 pounds, then you are not in the mega mammal club anymore. So um, what you see here is that these, each square here represents the finding of a fossil of an extinct mega mammal. And of course, what you see here is that at the end, it just sp spikes dramatically around the younger dryas, OK? So we've got the, uh, so in fact, what you see with, with those, the graphs that we just saw is that there was a period there of highly unstable climate. And how did the, the mega mammals, I don't necessarily think that they all died instantly, but you know, it may have actually been successive stages. To me, that's kind of what it looks like with maybe the final coup de gras occurring during the Younger Dryas, because to my knowledge, coming out of the Younger Dryas, I think the woolly mammoths and the giant ground sloths and saber-toothed cats and the Irish elk and the cave bears and the giant short-faced bear and the castoroides and all the rest were gone, right? So they didn't survive. Now, there's evidence that mammoths did survive even down to maybe five or 6,000 years ago, but they survived on islands and they shrank in size. Uh, be, probably because of limitations on their territory and so on, but they're called pygmy mammoths. And um, so it wasn't a complete extirpation like in one fell swoop, but it was, it was close to it when you look in the geological sense. So we see that this mortality graph correlates very well with this graph and with the spikes that we saw defining the period from 14.6 to 11.6. I'll also mention that, interesting, Plato 
as some of you who've watched my Atlantis presentation know that Plato named that date um, for the destruction of Atlantis. He placed that at 9,000 years prior to Solon's journey to Egypt where he heard the tale and interestingly his, his uh, journey to Egypt took place around, around 2,600 years ago, about 600 BC, so do the math. Comes right out to 11,600. So how interesting, and of course, generally, if it's even noted by historians or, or uh, archaeologists or whomever, uh, it's just dismissed as a mere coincidence that he uh, places the, the destruction of Atlantis through a, an event of subsidence uh, beneath, sinks beneath the waves during an exact period of time that we know that sea level was rapidly rising, even to the point where it's been called meltwater pulse 1B. Um, so now here is essentially a graph that shows us the distribution of ice in the northern hemisphere now. And you can see that there's sea ice over Antarctica and then there's continental ice or land ice over Greenland. Um, and then I'm going to go back to late glacial maximum times, and it looked more like that. So there was a whole lot more ice in the world. And if I go, let's see one more. Yeah, here we can see on this, this now we're focusing in uh, North America. And on the left, we actually have two great ice sheets in North America. The Laurentide, which is roughly centered over Hudson Bay, and it's about the size of the uh, Antarctica or South Polar ice cap is now. The Cordilleran ice sheet, you can see there's that little division between them that's, uh, they're just uh, right, it's a, pretty much just east of the Rocky Mountains out on the, the, the prairies of Alberta. And that was what some uh, paleontologists and anthropologists have referred to as the ice-free corridor, which may have been a migratory route both for animals and early um, human migration into North America. Cordilleran ice sheet was roughly the mass of the modern Greenland ice sheet and the, the Laurentide ice sheet was roughly the mass of the modern um, Antarctica ice sheet. And of course, they're both gone now. And there was also, if we go back one, you can see that there was also enormous buildup of ice over northwestern Europe as well. <clears throat> so between all of that ice, there was more than double the amount of ice than we find on the Earth today. And that was the, resulted in the 400, possibly even as much as 450 feet uh, decline in sea levels. And this <clears throat> is a series of images just to give you an idea. Now this is what this is going to do. It's going gonna, it's gonna to show the continental shelves and it's going to show the, the coastlines of the world if you drop sea levels 350 feet. <clears throat> so keep that in mind that what you're going to see now is actually very conservative because sea levels were at least 50 feet um, <clears throat> lower than 350 feet. But so here's the world, and I'm going to toggle back and forth a little bit here so you can see the change, the geographic changes. And then we'll, we'll zoom in on a couple of areas so you can, <clears throat> there's North America. I want you to look up there by Alaska, and you see the light blue area, that is the, the shelf, and that is what was called Beringia during the Ice Age because it was a whole intact ecosystem that was heavily populated by mega mammals. And when I go to the next slide, watch what happens. That's a pretty dramatic change. And look at, up, look at the islands and things up there in northern Canada. Uh, going back, look at, the, look at the peninsula of Florida. So you can see, look what happens to the uh, to the Gulf of Mexico. One of the things that that did was the, at present, the, the Gulf Stream diverts into the Gulf of Mexico, and because of that diversion, it picks up a lot of extra heat that is now taking and delivering to northwestern Europe before it loops back to the south. Um, but during the late glacial maximum, it bypassed the Gulf of Mexico. So that would have contributed to the, to the cooling, very much so. Um, here is an area that Graham Hancock has referred to quite frequently in his work. Um, you see this is uh, Indonesia down here, you see Australia, and you see the islands. Now if we drop sea levels 350 feet, there's a lot more land mass. Probably was, actually would have been a, a favorable place to 
uh, settle during the, the late glacial maximum. Remember again, this is still, if we drop it another 50 feet, some of those islands even become more connected. And this is likely during these times, during one of the full glacial times, I think it's speculated it would have been the most logical time for <clears throat> Australia to be um, populated. But you know, that, now we're going back 50 to 60,000 years ago. And here's Northwestern Europe. So I want you to notice Scandinavia, notice the, the British Isles there. And then you'll notice the light blue is the, is the shelf. We're gonna drop sea levels 350 feet. No British Isles are part of the continental mainland. How many of you realize that? that I know some of you did or do. So I think you can see, <clears throat> I, I'm just trying to give you the idea that it was a very different world. And not, not that long ago, in the geological sense, this is just a, a, a blink of the eye, right? So this, these, this level of change needs to be factored in when we start trying to understand the history of our own species on the planet because our ancestors lived through all of this. In fact, they probably lived through four cycles, something like this. And just another graph of... So 